Uh, my name is Lauren Cooper. I am the lead of the Forest Carbon and Climate Program at Michigan State University. And we're so pleased to lead this learning exchange session for the Forest Climate Working Group. I know we have some folks from outside of that group, including some colleagues here in the department and our partnering organizations. So I wanted to offer a quick description of the group. The Forest Climate Working Group is a diverse group of forest interests, including landowners, industry, conservationists, academia, and those active with carbon markets. The group has worked together for more than eight years to advocate for state and federal policies that work to ensure sustainable forest use and prevention of land use change. Uh, and we've currently been in the process of reinvigorating our focus and activities, and we welcome inquiries into our work. Um, so please reach out if you have questions or you think your organization may be interested in learning more about the Forest Climate Working Group. Today we have some great speakers. First, we have Jeff Williams, uh, the National Program Manager of the Healthy Forest Reserve Program at the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, or the NRCS. He will be talking about the Healthy Forest Reserve Program's work in restoring and protecting private forests, the program's goals and objectives, land and landowner eligibility criteria, funds obligated, and acres enrolled. Then we have Rita Height of the American Forest Foundation, where she is the Executive Vice President of the American Tree Farm System Woodlands and Policy. Rita will provide an update on, the, on Forest and the Farm Bill Coalition. With the Farm Bill set to expire in just a few months, the, farm, the Forest and the Farm Bill Coalition is actively working with Congress to secure support for forest priorities in this important legislation, including the Healthy Forest Reserve Program. Rita will discuss the Coalition's latest activities, along with the latest on the Healthy Forest Reserve Program and other programs that have carbon and climate mitigation benefits. Um, before we start though, a couple of details. Uh, we're also announcing the 2018 learning series uh, for, for the whole year. Um, these are going to take place on the first Wednesday of every month throughout 2018 from 3 to 4 p.m. We um, are currently uh, securing speakers for the specific dates and we will have more on that soon. But if you'd like to join our mailing list, you can be sure to get uh, the most up-to-date information and, and invitations from us to join the webinars. Also, our next speaker is going to be uh, Rachel Steele, uh, the National Climate Hubs Coordinator at the USDA Climate Hubs. She'll be speaking on April 4th at 3 p.m. and providing a brief overview of the USDA Climate Hubs uh, the recent accomplishments and where the organization is headed in 2018 and beyond. So again, please reach out to us by email forestc at msu.edu to automatically receive updates on this. And um, a couple of other housekeeping things, please make sure you're muted if you're on your phone, even though um, I think that shouldn't be an issue with our new uh, service. Uh, also wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded and um, we will post the recording and any supplemental uh, resources, including the presentation slides in the next week or so. So since you're registered, you'll receive an email letting you know where to find that. We will hold questions until the end. And on the Zoom interface, you can hopefully see the little chat box in the bottom right corner, um, has a little drop down triangle next to it. And here you can offer up questions at any point throughout the presentations and we'll compile and present questions to the speakers in a Q&A at the end, time permitting. Uh, if you're calling in by phone, uh, but you'd like to submit a question, feel free to email us at forestc at msu.edu and we can um, add your question to the list. And in the case of outstanding questions, we'll work with the speakers and create a document answering those questions that will be uploaded with the presentation materials. So uh, that's it for the background. Jeff, uh, could you please take the screen and begin your presentation? Okay. Thank you, Lauren and Lauren. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Healthy Forest Reserve Program. Can you, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Great. All right. Um, and I'd like to say uh, thank Dave, Dave Cleaves as well uh, for reaching out and uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this, um, this program. So this is the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, um, Restoring and Protecting Private Forests. Uh, this photo here is a recent tour we took um, in the uh, Florida Panhandle for a, uh, a an RCPP project, which I will uh, talk about that program a little bit um, later in my presentation. 
I don't expect this, the slides to take real long. Um, I usually talk pretty fast, so if I'm uh, going too fast, please don't hesitate to let me know, and I will try to uh, cover, cover it a little bit more slowly and thoroughly. So first off, I'd like to talk about um, Healthy Forest Reserve Program is a voluntary program established to assist private landowners to restore and enhance forest land. There's three purposes, to promote the recovery of threatened and endangered species, to improve plant and animal diversity, and to enhance carbon sequestration. Uh, specifically, I understand there's an interest in carbon sequestration. It is discussed um, in, uh, in legislation fairly broadly. Um, so I, this is the points where I've, I see it discussed in, the, in policy. Uh, to the extent practical, eligible practices and measures will improve biodiversity and optimize the sequestration of carbon through management that means, maintains diverse and high quality native forests to accomplish the goals of the restoration plan. In addition, states may consider the potential for incre increased carbon sequestration if the lands in question are enrolled in the, in the program for ranking projects. So uh, carbon sequestration can be used by the states uh, to, um, as far as a, a ranking projects, comparing projects, seeing if they should be funded or not. Uh, states can decide how many points, what percentage, what portion uh, carbon sequestration uh, would provide. Um, Healthy Forest Reserve Program under HFRP, NRCS purchases easements to protect or restore privately owned or tribal land. Uh, currently, HFRP is not funded, traditionally funded through the Farm Bill. However, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, RCPP, has provided opportunities to, for partners to submit HFRP proposals. Um, just, I'm gonna just slide up and cheat on my notes here real quick. So you're, you're not hallucinating, your screen's getting a little bit smaller. So the program was authorized in 2003 with the Healthy Forest Restoration Act and was later amended by the 2008 Food and Energy Act, Agriculture Act of uh, 2014. The program is currently authorized through 2018. Uh, the Healthy Forest Reserve Program is designed to assist private landowners to restore and enhance their private forest land. Uh, the goals of the program are to promote the recovery of threatened and endangered species. I think I've mentioned these already. I'll see them again. Uh, improve plant and animal diversity and to enhance carbon sequestration. Um, slide back down. Uh, so again, HFRP was authorized as part of the Healthy Forest Restoration Act of 2013. It was amended, um, the latest amendment was enacted in February 7th of 2015. Um, HFRP has uh, many programmatic similarities to the older, uh, some of you may be aware of the Wetland Reserve Program, or we call it WRP, and the current Agriculture Conservation Easement Program the wetland reserve easement component. So a lot of the similarities um, between WRE and WRP um, exist. So you also find additional um, language in Title VIII, Section 8203 of the Agriculture Act of 2014. $12 million was authorized for uh, 2014 to 2018. However, no appropriation was received just for straight HFRP, we did get some through um, RCP. I have a couple of success stories I'll talk about in here. Um, Andy Peterson is a participant in the Healthy Forest Reserve Program. Uh, is a voluntary uh, easement program designed for the purpose of restoring and enhancing forest ecosystems. In Oregon, the program focuses on the recovery of the threatened, of the threatened uh, northern spotted owl. Um, the landowner said, this program fits our goals, said Andy. We are able to harvest, and there are some specific guidelines to help establish spotted owl habitat, but we can still make a living off the land, which is important. We can't afford not to, we're able to, uh, but we are able to with this program. So HFRP is often referred to as a working lands conservation easement program. So that's kind of a uh, unique program compared to some that are just mostly res restoration and protection. Um, so for HFRP program requirements, um, NRCS 
purchases 30-year or perpetual easements, it enters into 30-year contracts with tribes, or 10-year cost-share agreements with elig eligible landowners. Uh, landowners agree to implement the plan which restores, protects, enhances, maintains, and manages habitats to increase likelihood of recovery of listed species under the ESA, Endangered Species Act, to measurably improve well-being of candidate species, state listed species, or species identified by the chief of the NRCS. Um, NRCS may provide cost share assistance uh, for activities that promote ecosystem functions and values. Such activities may be carried out by the landowner or other NRCS designated. So we can do landowner contracts or federal contracts. Again, here's just another picture of um, some potential HFRP land in Florida. Uh, landowner eligibility. Um, individual or entity must be the owner of the elig eligible private land or qualify under the definition of acreage owned by an Indian tribe. Unlike most of the Farm Bill programs, um, Adjusted Gross Income, or AGI, and, oh, I forgot to spell it out, H-E-L-W-C, Highly Erodible Land Water Wetland Compliance Eligibility are not required under HFRP. This is a major departure from other Farm Bill programs. Um, in addition, landowner must agree to uh, other information that are yes, necessary. That's, um, very uh, land eligibility. Land must be privately owned or owned by Indian tribes. Lands may be included in the program based on the likelihood of success, restoration, successful restoration, enhancement, and protection of the forest ecosystem functions and values when considering the costs of enrollment, restoration, protection, enhancement, maintenance, and management. Land must be measurable must measurably increase the likelihood of recovery of the threatened or endangered species, candidate species, state listed species, or species are special concern. Land must improve biological diversity and increase carbon sequestration. Here's a, an example in Florida. The Coastal Headwaters Forest Project is a private, public-private partnership that will provide restoration of longleaf pine and permanent protection of working forests across the Mobile, per, I'm not going to try, and other parts of other watersheds in Alabama and Florida. Uh, the primary objectives of coastal headwaters are to establish conservation easements to protect the lands as working longleaf pine forests in perpetuity, um, support working forest related economic development in local communities and create and expand markets for longleaf pine products. Uh, provide ecological benefits for plants and animals inherent to the longleaf system, ecosystem. Um, easement participation requirements. The deed shall require easement, the easement area be maintained in accordance to the HFRP plan. Completed in, by NRCS and the landowner for the life of the easement. Landowner must cooperate in the restoration, protection, enhancement, maintenance, and management of the land in accordance with the easement in terms of the Conservation easement deed describes the permissions, restrictions, prohibitions, and reserved rights by the landowner. So again, this is a conservation easement, it is not a fee, fee title. 30-year contract requirements. Contract shall, the contract shall require easement area be maintained in accordance with the HFRP plan for the life of the contract. The landowner must cooperate in the restoration, protection, enhancement, maintenance, and management of the land in accordance with the contract and terms of the plan. HFRP restoration plans and landowner protections. Uh, plans shall be made the plan shall be made through NRCS, who shall consult with the program participant, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and National Marine Fisheries Service as appropriate. The plan shall specify the manner in which the land will be restored, enhanced, protected, maintained, and managed. Um, I think this is Pennsylvania. So productive partnerships are crucial to safeguard, safeguarding the survival of the Indiana bat and to increase existing populations. For this federally endangered species, Pennsylvania NRCS assumes an essential responsibility. The Healthy Forest Reserve Program through NRCS is designed to assist private landowners in restoring, enhancing, and protecting forest land resources. 
In Pennsylvania, this funding is used to protect and improve critical habitat for the Indiana bat through the acquisition, conservation easements, and the implementation of selected conservation practices to improve habitat. Here is a very small map for you to try to see. Basically, there's 13 states um, that have uh, in, in the past qualified and been selected for funding in the United States. Um, and I noted California and Maine uh, didn't show up on here. These are just Um, this is just an example of a, um, some practices. Prescribed burning, fire breaks, forest site prep, tree shrub establishment, upland wildlife habitat management, and forest harvest trails, landings, et cetera, um, are potential um, treatments, practices that could be considered in HFRP. That is in no way uh, all-inclusive. <clears throat> Okay, HFRP, financial assistance dollars, acres in enrollments. So from 2009 up to 2007, uh, there's been approximately $42 million um, obligated in financial assistance. That's about 676,000 um, acres um, protected or actively being protected. Um, this is where I need my name. And then there's about 105 enrollments, which means either contracts um, or easements. So the states included um, under the traditional HFRP are Arkansas, California, Georgia, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine, Michigan, Mississippi, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and uh, South Carolina. Um, so most of these acres are actually in um, a few restoration, long-term, 10-year restoration agreements. So a lot of these acres that are being protected are just really fairly short-term. Um, here's a table, essentially, by year, showing obligation by year. I'm not sure how exciting that is for you. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, HFRP and RCPP. HFRP has not been funded, um, appropriated for several years, which has directly affected the amount of dollars obligated to restoration and conservation easements as seen by lower annual enrollments and acres protected. However, under the provisions of RCPP, HFRP has seen a resurgence in interest from partners who bring comprehensive strategies and leverage comp conservation investments to address landscape scale natural resource challenges. So, um, uh, okay. um, under RCPP and HFRP, we've uh, awarded approximately $49 million in financial assistance, approximately 5 million in technical assistance, and partners have contributed I uh, plan on contributing $1.5 million. That brings total value of the 16 RCPP projects using the HFRP program to about $55 million. And just one last shot of the Florida landscape. And that is it. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jeff. Um, that was really interesting. I'm sure we're gonna have some great questions about that. Uh, but before we dive into the questions, and particularly since um, you guys are on such similar topics, Rita, why don't we have um, you take the screen and, um, and dive into your presentation? Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, and I'm assuming you all can see my screen. Looks good. All right. Um, as you can see, I went for some spring colors because it is spring, darn it. So um, what I will do to build on Jeff's um, remarks is really to highlight where things stand with the um, expiration of the Farm Bill and um, what we can expect from a policy change perspective in particular with the Healthy Forest Reserve Program. Um, and in particular, I think the reason why we're focusing on this program is this is one of the, uh, of, of, uh, one of the only 
um, Farm Bill Conservation Programs that very distinctly has carbon sequestration as one of its goals. That doesn't mean that the Farm Bill doesn't um, support carbon sequestration in a lot of other ways. Um, so I'll talk about that as well. Um, so what I'll hit today is what does the Farm Bill do for forests right now? Um, what can we expect in 18? And then what are some key priorities from a policy perspective in, in 18? So um, the current Farm Bill, um, and I get this question asked a lot, why the heck do you care about the Farm Bill? It's, it's about agriculture and it's about nutrition. Is it really about forests? Um, and AFF does a regular forest in the Farm Bill progress report to really understand how the Farm Bill is supporting private forests in the US. And our estimate is that um, over the last three years, um, since 2014, um, the Farm Bill has provided about $1.8 billion um, for private forests. Um, and so this is all the programs that impact private forests, everything from the Healthy Forest Reserve Program to the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which helps provide cost share um, assistance for landowners to implement specific practices, which again, all of these things have carbon implications. Um, for example, under EQIP, you can do afforestation, reforestation, improved forest management, et cetera. So that 1.86 billion, um, and we estimate that um, that translates into impacting about 9,000 acres a day of private forests in the US are impacted by that, those farm bill dollars. 9,000 acres a day. I am not a scientist or a mathematician, but I'm sure Dave Cleese is very um, uh, quickly calculating how much carbon um, that it translates into, and it's a pretty significant number. Um, so again, pretty, pretty strong impact on our forests um, and our private forests in particular in the US. Um, the Farm Bill also, um, while it um, provides dollars for private forests, it also is a mechanism to drive policy change. So for example, um, the Forest Climate Working Group has for a long time believed that we not only have to support forests, but we also have to support the use of forest products um, as a key strategy for um, mitigating and addressing climate change. So for example, the last Farm Bill improved um, USDA's bio-based program which um, helps ensure that forest products can participate in, um, in federal purchasing um, of bio-based products. So again, a market opportunity to increase the use of forest products, which has carbon um, benefits as well. So um, here's a, just a table of the um, funding provided through the various programs. And um, my numbers are a little different than Jeff's because I, I use a different slice here, but as you can see, um, HFRP, as Jeff mentioned, not funded um, with um, mandatory dollars. It does have a discretionary authorization um, at 12, 12 million, but it's not been funded. And then it only has received money through RCPP. You can see here the, um, throughout all these other programs though, um, the dollars that are going in, again, these are broad. This is for all the programs, not specific to forests necessarily. So you can see the dollars for EQIP and the conservation stewardship program, et cetera. But this is the range of programs in the Farm Bill that impact forests. Um, and, and just another little snapshot of kind of the impact of um, the Farm Bill programs. We've seen a pretty significant increase um, in the investment that Farm Bill programs have put into private forests um, in the US. As you can see, we've nearly doubled, um, actually more than doubled, um, the amount of funding in EQIP, this is just EQIP alone, um, combined with WIP, which is the, an old wildlife program, um, you can see that um, there's been a pretty significant increase in just EQIP alone in the, the dollars going towards forestry. And again, these are practices like afforestation, planting trees, reforestation, um, improved forest management, all those things that the Forest Climate Working Group has um, emphasized as key strategies for um, addressing climate change. Um, Jeff mentioned the Healthy Forest Reserve Program in those active states. Um, so here's just another slice at the data and the, um, the states that are participating in that program. Um, most, as he said, have been um, pre when HFRP did have funding from the 2008 Farm Bill, um, but then that funding, um, 2008, 2000, yes, 2008, um, and then uh, that funding went away in the 2014 and we rely on RCPP for most of that funding at this point, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So that's just a little background on um, what the Farm Bill does for forests currently. 
Um, and so let's talk about what we can expect um, for the 2018 Farm Bill, um, kind of the big picture. And you know, the, the, the big picture is the current Farm Bill expires, as Lauren mentioned at the beginning of this call, at the end of September of 2018. Um, so Congress, in theory, has to act by the end of September of 2018 to ensure that um, these conservation programs, but also to ensure that the commodity programs that are funded through the Farm Bill, as well as the nutrition programs, and a whole range of other things that um, Americans all across the board rely on, continue to be um, funded and supported. Um, what we are hearing now in terms of the timing of the, um, the process so um, neither um, the House or Senate Agriculture Committee have acted yet on their bill. Um, we are hearing that um, any day now, um, the House in particular could move forward. Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're thinking the late March, April timeline for, for them to act. Um, and then the Senate could move um, soon after, although the Senate seems to be on a different timeline and they also have a bunch of other um, confirmations that they're dealing with as well. So that will probably also impact timing. The other thing that will impact timing is um, both the House and the Senate Agriculture Committee's ability to secure floor time um, to actually move a bill on the House and Senate floor, which um, you know neither committee wants their bill hanging out there for too long. They want their um, body to act quickly. So we'll see, um, hopefully, um, the House move fairly quickly, um, late March, early April and the committees will mark up a bill, um, i.e. they'll go through a process of amending the bill and the members on the Agriculture Committee will have a chance to improve it, change it. Um, and then once um, the committee passes that bill out of committee, then um, again, we'll, we'll see the, the bill move on the floor and the House, full House will have an opportunity to offer amendments as well as um, vote on final passage. Um, a couple other big picture pieces here, the budget. So um, the, 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 climate, the budget climate um, for this farm, farm bill is not rosy. The budget climate for farm bills is not usually rosy, but this one is less rosy than the last. Um, and in particular, because there are um, a huge number, um, I believe the number is 36, but don't quote me on that, 36 um, programs that were um, that are not funded following this farm bill unless Congress finds more money for them. So in other words, those programs don't have what's called a baseline continuing funding after, um, you know, in, into the, the future post 2018. So Congress has to find, if they want those programs to continue, has to find money for those. And those are things like the entire rural development program. Um, <coughs> doesn't have um, funding after this 18 Farm Bill unless Congress finds it for them. Um, the Energy Title has a number of programs that don't continue um, with funding unless Congress finds them for them. So the, the budget climate is very tight. Um, combine that with the fact that the agriculture, um, kind of traditional agriculture commodity world um, is not in very good straits right now. So um, there will be additional pinch um, to, to deal with, with some of the agriculture um, commodity issues as well. Um, the other piece of this is, um, from what we can tell, um, the agriculture committees at this point haven't taken a hit, however, um, in having to find more savings in their bill like they did last time around. So the last farm bill, the agriculture committee found, I believe it was around $23 billion in savings when they passed their bill. Um, at this point, um, it, it, they are not being called on to, to find that level of savings, which is a pretty significant um, benefit. That could change. but. Um, that's where things are. The other thing I will mention is um, from an overall theme perspective is that, um, you know, last Farm Bill, there was a lot of consolidation, um, a lot of streamlining, a lot of, um, you know, reducing duplication in programs, that those themes continue. Um, so there are continuous efforts to try to streamline, um, again, kind of um, uh, consolidate programs where they can to increase efficiency and delivery, et cetera. So we'll see that continue in, into this farm bill as well. Um, so a little bit about the forests and the farm bill coalition. So this coalition um, has actually been together. It's a national coalition that works on forest priorities in the farm bill. I think the name is um, very original, of course. Um, this coalition has been around since in working together since the 2002 farm bill. So this is our fourth farm bill working together. 
Um, and the coalition has um, grown by leaps and bounds since 2002. Um, and I believe actually since the 14 Farm Bill, we've um, grown uh, three times as much um, as the number of participants we had in, in the 2014 process. Um, we now have, a bit, I believe the number is 106 um, participants in the coalition, 106 different organizations. Um, and that runs the gamut of um, landowners, conservation groups, industry, um, you know, everybody from Weyerhaeuser to the Wilderness Society are participants in this coalition. Um, and the coalition come up, came up with a range of recommendations um, for the Farm Bill through a process that um, you know, involved a, a series of working groups that developed ideas. Um, and there were a huge number of recommendations that came out of those working groups. And then the coalition actually did a process to um, survey our entire membership, figure out where folks' priorities were and winnow down that number to the set that is in our platform right now. Um, we do have recommendations on funding, um, and the, the basic message we are sending on funding for the programs that impact forests um, are at a minimum maintain. Again, this is not a climate um, where we can ask for huge new slugs of money. So the, um, you know, our, our approach is we have to at least maintain what we have. There are two exceptions to that um, from a funding perspective. Um, two major exceptions, there's a few nuances there, but um, the two major exceptions are the coalitions asking for $12 million annually in mandatory funding for the Healthy Forest Reserve Program. Um, and the coalition is also asking for $50 million a year in um, mandatory funding for the Community Wood Energy Program modified, which I can hit in a minute. Um, so again, most of the other programs, EQIP, um, the Conservation Stewardship Program, et cetera, are all um, at a minimum maintain. So the Forest and the Farm Bill um, Coalition recommendations fall in these six buckets. Um, one is uh, support markets. So how do we, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key um, priorities of the Forest Climate Working Group um, to address climate has always been how do we enable more um, use of forest products? So these recommendations um, uh, are, are, are along those same lines. For example, the Timber Innovation Act, which is about supporting research and development for um, it, building more buildings with wood, especially tall wood buildings, which again has a huge um, carbon um, benefit and keeps stores carbon long-term. I mentioned the Community Wood Energy Program as another um, program that the, the coalition is actually asking for a pretty significant chunk of funding for. And this program, what we're trying to do is enable this program to help address the need for markets for um, low value, small diameter material. Um, this is a huge issue across the country right now, where um, in the West, if we want to reduce our um, wildfire risk and address the hazardous fuels buildup, we need to find a market for low value material, a way to sell that wood so that the cost of treatment is economical. Um, other parts of the country, it's not, it's not necessarily fire, but other issues where um, if we wanna provide the habitat um, that folks want, if we wanna address forest health issues like invasive species and other challenges, um, it's important to reduce um, and, and eliminate, <laughs> reduce the amount of small diameter material and allow our forests to grow healthy and more resilient. Again, ties to carbon in that a healthy, resilient forest is also um, a forest that can sequester and store carbon more effectively. So a tool to help um, enable that sort of um, improved forest management that is essential um, for a variety of outcomes, including carbon. Um, we've talked about the, um, the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, the coalition's focused on that, as well as some other recommendations that will conserve and enhance wildlife habitat in particular. Um, and the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, we are looking for some improvements in that program that um, really do two things. One is enable um, forests that are already restored, um, but provide habitat, important habitat, to clearly be qualify for the program. So perhaps a landowner has um, an existing forest land that provides spotted owl habitat, as Jeff's example um, 
uh, highlighted and um, that forest is already providing good habitat, um, but the landowner needs some incentives to continue that. The idea is to clearly ensure that the, that um, land is eligible. Um, and then uh, secondly, the other priority um, recommendation for the coalition is to expand um, the ability for um, a, a broader range of at-risk species to qualify for the program and in particular um, species that um, are of greatest conservation need identified in state wildlife action plans and forest action plans. So again, trying to broaden the ability to use that program for a variety of things that enhance habitat. But also, of course, again, have carbon um, benefit as well. The um, Forest Climate Working Group has, for a very long time, had a priority of keeping forests as forests, ensuring we can retain forests because that's one of the best ways to um, uh, ensure that we can continue to capture and store carbon in, in forests um, as a huge mitigation of climate change. So um, the coalition does have a number of recommendations on this, in particular trying to improve the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program which is a program that supports um, uh, purchasing of easements largely. There are some flexibility like HFRP in some of the program areas. But um, right now the program has a bit of a restriction on forest participation in it. So we are asking for um, a waiver that allows for forest participation in the program if the secretary determines there's an important conservation need. So the idea is to you know, allow forests that are a pure forest tract versus a tract that is um, uh, affiliated just with a farm operation to, to participate in that program. We have some recommendations around addressing some fire and forest health challenges. Again, all this ties to, to carbon and, and improving carbon sequestration and storage and creating more resilient forests. Um, another issue that um, the Forest Climate Working Group also has similarities on is creating landscape scale solutions. So the idea being here that um, if we work at a landscape scale and focus resources in, in important landscapes like if we want to think about it from a climate perspective, are there particular landscapes that are more important to addressing um, carbon sequestration and storage than others? Perhaps we should focus resources and scale up our work in those types of landscapes to be more effective in addressing the challenges. So that's the idea behind these landscape scale solutions is um, can we actually create a program? Um, there's actually an existing program that we're building off of um, that um, will enable more of this landscape scale focus. So that is another of the coalition's recommendations that align very nicely with the Forest Climate Working Group. And then lastly, we also um, have a series of recommendations around education, research, inventory, um, and in particular, the coalition folk has a recommendation on continuing to support the forest inventory and analysis program. That's a program that is run by the Forest Service and provides a huge amount of information and data about forest carbon in the U.S. in addition to forest, forest stocks and forest health issues and all sorts of things. So it's a really important data source um, as we try to look at trends and information about what's happening in our forests and our forest carbon stocks. So a lot of the estimates that USDA does on and EPA does on greenhouse gas inventories and forests come um, partially from that FIA data. So again, that's um, kind of the series and there's all sorts of recommendations under each of these categories I didn't go into. Um, you're welcome to visit AFF's website and um, find those recommendations right on our website. Um, but thought I would hit some of those that intersect closely with um, the Forest Climate Working Group's priorities um, as well. So one other issue that um, I'll just raise that also impacts the Farm Bill, um, although may not be a Farm Bill issue, um, is the fact that um, even as we're trying to improve these programs, even as we're trying to ensure that we can continue to have funding support, um, if we don't solve this wildfire funding problem that the Forest Service has, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the issue is that over time, as wildfires um, become more and more expensive um, and more extensive um, across the country, um, the Forest Service um, has to pay more for fighting fires which ultimately ends up eating more of the agency's budget. 
Um, that's basically the bottom line here. Oops, sorry, I will go back. <laughs> um, that's the, the bottom line here. And so you can see here in this graphic where um, in 1995, wildfire um, costs were about 16% um, percent of the agency budget. And by 2025, and this estimate has actually been um, dropped, I think, to 2022 now, um, fire will consume a huge portion um, of the agency's budget. So um, about 67% there um, is the estimate. So we can um, create all these opportunities and farm bill programs to improve forests, um, but if we don't um, ensure that the main agency um, in the government, in addition to NRCS, um, the Forest Service, can um, support programs outside of fire, um, you know, because again, as these, these firefighting costs increase, there's less and less funding to support things like helping private forest landowners manage their land or managing public forests. Um, so a huge challenge that um, also needs to be addressed and um, we believe is important, just as important as addressing some of those farm bill recommendations as well. So um, that is the status of the farm bill and the kind of current layout of the forest um, and the farm bill coalition's recommendations. Um, what we're hearing right now um, from the Hill is we've actually gotten very good reception from the Hill on our recommendations that I've walked through and many others. Um, you know, the devil's still in, in the details as to whether or not they'll be included in the agriculture committee's bills, um, but we are getting fairly good reception in particular on a lot of the policy changes we're talking about. The funding issues will be um, an ongoing um, uh, battle um, simply because of the, the budget climate we are operating in. Um, so with that, um, that's essentially kind of where things are with the Farm Bill and I'm gonna turn it back over to Lauren um, to facilitate questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rita. That was very informative um, and I do, to, so to do questions, I'll, I'll catch you before you um, take your screen away. One of the first questions we have is, um, you shared a table of acreage and uh, by state of projects, I believe under the HFRP. Oh yeah, so um, somebody had a question, do you know what, what's going on in Maine in this case? I'm not sure if you're, or Jeff, you may know as well. Uh, yeah, um, Rita, do you know specifically or? You, go ahead, Jeff, if you okay, okay, I yeah. can answer it. But. Um, I, was, I was looking that up, and yeah, I don't have all the data in front of me handy, but I can tell you there's 420,000 acres and two 10-year uh, restoration contracts in Maine. So um, very large um, enrollments, very large projects. Two of them, two-thirds of it, are in 10-year restoration contracts, which I imagine, I think I saw are about halfway done. So. Yeah, and I think um, to add to that, Jeff, um, the key thing about the Healthy Forest Reserve Program that's different from some of the other conservation programs is there is no limit on the size of the landowner that can participate in this program. So um, yes, to, to just reiterate Jeff's point, um, uh, there are a couple of very, very large um, private forest owners participating in that program in Maine. So yeah, that, that would come about because of the lack of AGI. I mean, so you can have fairly large corporations participate in this program. And you know, the, the upside of that is uh, you can get very large uh, projects in place. Mm -hmm. So yep. hope that answers your question to some degree. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Another related question is, Jeff, you had mentioned that carbon sequestration requirements are a part of this program now, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could uh, talk about that a little bit more. What does that look like? And is there actual monitoring in place for that? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's defined pretty broadly. Um, that would be done by our in-state uh, biological specialists that would make that determination to decide what those practices are. and 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 to what mag order you know to what level of significance they would they would uh, occur so uh you know whatever the the practice they have in mind to to meet that again it's it's uh, not really finely uh defined it's it's pretty broadly defined uh, carbon sequestration so 
So th mm -hmm. you're, you're saying there just has to be some sort of carbon considerations in a project that like to be accepted into this program? Yeah, but again, to what degree, to what, you know, uh, how that's measured and how that's determined is, is done on a state by state, project by project uh, manner. So. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. Um, another question is, um, is you had mentioned that, uh, and you mentioned this as well, that there, there has not been funding for the HFRP um, in, in recent years, um, but then you had laid out some investments, um, some other investments, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, um, about you know, where those are coming from and if those are expected to continue if the HFRP is not funded directly. Is that a question for me or for Rita? I, I, it could be for either of you, I suppose. Um, I can only speak to uh, HF, uh, and I'll just, you know, tell you my, what I've observed. I don't have an opinion about it, or whatever uh, the administration uh, offers. So um, uh, currently under HFRP, it has been authorized but not appropriated. Um, under RCPP, there's some of the programs that uh, Rita has in her table there are contributing programs. HFRP has not had funds to contribute, so they've benefited from getting some of the, so it goes into this, it creates this annual uh, bucket of $100 million, and uh, HFRP is, has benefited from receiving funds from that. So it's been kind of uh, a way for uh, partners to submit uh, projects and, and to use those program, programs that would address, you know, in one of those three purposes. Okay. And, and Lauren, maybe a little bit more color on that um, as well. So yeah, in the last Farm Bill, um, even though we weren't able to get funding, um, mandatory funding, um, and the difference between mandatory and discretionary is mandatory is provided through the Farm Bill and for all intents and pur pur purposes <laughs> with some issues, um, required, Congress basically funds it and then it's done, um, whereas discretionary it goes through the annual appropriations process. Um, and what Jeff's referring to is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is the idea behind that program is um, uh, uh, any kind of organizations, usually it's nonprofits um, or agencies, um, apply to the program and say, we want to do a landscape scale project um, using um, a variety of authorities that the USDA has, um, that USDA NRCS has, including some might be forested properties, some might be um, agriculture properties, et cetera. So they smush all those authorities together to do a landscape scale project. And what Jeff's talking about is that um, there are some um, applicants that have applied and received funding to fund forest related projects through the Healthy Forest Reserve Program under that um, Regional Conservation Partnership Program. I see. Thanks to you both. That was that was um, very helpful. So for the the last question that I have here is oh I might have another one. Um, well, one question that I have here um, is that it is about the equip program, which you know is clearly a, a large uh, amount of money. And um, Rita, I was really interested to read or to hear that it it covers you know afforestation, reforestation, and and improved forest management. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how that those mechanisms work, if it's direct funding to landowners, and then if there are, are carbon um, considerations there as well. Yeah, so um, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program has been around for quite a while, actually. I'm trying to find my graph here. Um, so um, the program is a cost share program. So what that means is that um, instead of doing more long-term agreements like the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, easements like the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, what, the, what this program does is a landowner applies and says, I want to do um, you know, some thinning on my property to improve forest health, or I want to plant some trees on my property to improve wildlife, soil quality, et cetera. Um, and so the, the program is actually directed at the kind of key priorities of the program are to improve um, soil um, health and I think water quality is in there. There's a few other priorities, which of course forests um, help contribute to. 
So a landowner applies and says, I wanna do this practice, um, and then NRCS um, will evaluate that application, evaluate it based on their state level priorities. States set different priorities for forests. Um, and then uh, once um, the landowner is accepted and they've signed a contract, essentially NRCS will pay some of the cost. Um, the landowner has to contribute a chunk as well, um, pay some of the cost of doing that practice. And again, the reason being that there are benefits um, of a landowner doing that practice, water quality, soil health, um, habitat, all those sorts of benefits. From a carbon perspective, um, there is no um, evaluation of projects and applicants based on their carbon benefit. Um, but I, I would argue that a lot of the practices that are being done, and I wish I had, I, I do have a pie chart um, in our Farm Bill report that shows you the breakdown of the forest practices. Um, and there are a lot of practices um, in there that are known to improve carbon sequestration and storage, things like tree planting, things like um, you know, thinning that reduces fire risk and improves long-term forest health and resiliency, um, those sorts of kinds of practices that have carbon benefit. Thank you very much for that, Rita. Um, and I do have, I did have one more question come in and I'm, I'm not sure I understand it well. I tried to communicate back with this person. I realized they can't see my comment to them. Um, but I think their question is um, exploring the, uh, you know, we have new large conversations going on about infrastructure and um, where, where is the case for natural infrastructure um, in, in these larger like national level, level infrastructure questions. Um, and this person also mentioned uh, dealing with flooding in the mid-Atlantic and riparian management um, is all seems to be leaning towards gray infrastructure. So are you, are you aware of any connection then between uh, the farm bill or you know, wood utilization and, and um, natural infrastructure? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And um, there definitely are um, a lot of folks who have been trying to figure out how to bring natural infrastructure, green infrastructure, into the, the conversation on um, infrastructure. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody has been successful yet in kind of um, gaining the attention and figuring out how to, how to bring that into the fold. Um, and so that could run the gamut of everything from, you know, addressing flooding issues like, like um, you described to um, you know, investing in easement programs that um, provide green space and, and offset some of the um, impacts of gray infrastructure. Um, and it could also um, include things like investing in um, wooden bridges and um, other um, wood-based infrastructure um, investments, um, road barriers, um, things like that, that can all be built out of wood. Um, and there's been a lot of proven testing that's been done on that. So there is a lot of opportunity there. There are a number of groups that are trying to figure out how to um, get in that game. I don't think anybody has figured out how to get in the game yet. Okay, thank you so much for that. And I did get one more question that came in um, and this was directed towards you, Rita. Do you have any thoughts about how the forest legacy program will be affected by the 2018 farm bill? Yeah, so the forest legacy program um, for background for folks is um, a permanent easement program where, and it also allows for fee simple for acquisition of lands as well. It's run by the state forestry agencies um, in the states and it's housed in the US Forest Service. Um, obviously, um, acquiring um, uh, land and purchasing easements to protect forests long term um, has huge um, carbon benefit and again, a key priority of the Forest Climate Working Group. In terms of the Farm Bill, um, so the Farm Bill did authorize and create the Forest Legacy Program back in the 90s. Um, the Farm Bill, the Forest Legacy Program is actually not funded through the Farm Bill, it's funded through the annual appropriations process from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, so it's a little different funding mechanism. So the most the Farm Bill would do to the Forest Legacy Program, if it is brought up, is tweak the authority, change the authority of, in the program, change the legislation essentially, rather than deal with the funding. Um, and the, um, what, what's to be expected on that? Um, our coalition did not have any recommendations 
um, the Forest Legacy Program for improving it. Um, the last couple of farm bills, um, the agriculture committees have um, in some cases proposed capping the Forest Legacy Program and the funding for the program at certain amounts. Um, that's largely been what some of the recommendations have been in the past. So could we see those again, potentially? Um, I don't know. Um, I have not seen anything to suggest that. Um, but uh, that's, that's kind of the extent to which the Farm Bill could address the Forest Legacy Program is again, kind of changing the policy behind it. <clears throat> well, thank you for that, Rita. That was, um, that was really interesting and helpful. And I think that's it for the questions where we are closing in here at the end of our, our hour. Um, and so I want to thank you both. Thank you to Jeff and to Rita again for your time, sharing your insight. This was really useful. Uh, very, very informative and timely. Um, and thank you also to the, the Forest Climate Working Group and the Steering Committee and their support um, in uh, bringing forward these learning series. We really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, and again, this is a reminder that we will have another one a month from now, the first Wednesday uh, of April, April 4th at 3 p.m. with um, Rachel Steele. And please keep an eye out for the announcement of that. And, um, and if we have your email, we'll go ahead and send you an invite as soon as we have that prepared. And again, you can email us at forestc at msu.edu if you want to get on our mailing list. Uh, we will um, be reaching out about that. And, um, and that's it. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch when these are posted and available for your use um, in the future on our website. Take care. Have a great rest of your week.